Thank you everyone for joining me today on, on this webinar. I'll be your host, Matt Roberts, editor of the Public Sector Executive. And it's a pleasure to already see our audience, our virtual audience, filling up. So I hope we can give some real great insights today. The main point of today's webinar discussions, we're going to be delving into Gen Z and the public sector particularly. Share, coming together and sharing insights among myself and our brilliant uh, panel of guests and also better understanding some of the ways that we can support and encourage the next generation to take up careers in the sector. I'm delighted to not be alone in those conversations though. As I say, we've got a great panel of guests, which join me shortly. So we have Clive Webb, Senior Subject Manager for Business Management at ACCA. We have Hanan Sawa, Town Councillor at Winslow Council. Michelle Como bura Assistant Director for Skills and Employment, Greater London Authority and John Mark Williams, Chief Executive for the Institute of Leadership and Management. So without further ado, we'll jump straight into the questions and let my esteemed guests share with you their insights, which are probably more valuable than my own. So Clive, we'll go to yourself first. Um, would you mind sort of setting the scene a little bit for us around Gen Z employment, working practices, both in our sector and wider? I know that yourself, your organization, ACC, have done a lot of work into there's a lot of research um, in the preferred working styles. Does the current direction we're seeing line up with um, what employers are offering, particularly in the public sector? Well, thank you very much indeed. And it's a pleasure to be with you. I thought probably the best way to start this is to give you the headlines from our recent report on Generation Z. Um, and they come in seven points, essentially. Firstly, that for Generation Z, Careers are very much a personal pathway and a personal agenda, but they have significant worries around job security and well-being. That Generation Z themselves prize organisations that provide them with opportunities to acquire skills and maintain a good work-life balance. And I'm sure that's something that we'll pick up in the conversation a little bit later on. But those already in employment want fast progression and expect to have varied and what might be described, I guess, as more portfolio type of careers, moving from one area to another um, with a sense of frequency, I guess, but, but with variability. And the fourth point that they do appreciate as digital natives, I guess, that technology presents an opportunity but it also, to some extent, is a threat. And this ongoing discussion about the impact of technology on the workplace and the roles that they perform is something that does worry them. And there are concerns from our report around the role of business and the role of organisations themselves because they're a very ethical generation. And that's something, again, I'm sure we will pick up on in discussions as well. Um, for ACCA, the good news is that a career in accountancy is seen as attractive and a gateway to opportunity. And that opportunity is not just about the accountancy profession, it's about the role in business and society. And this sense of the contribution to society is absolutely fundamental to this generation. But the views across sectors are significantly different. So for public sector, a lack of job security, and progression as well as mental health issues figure strongly and about 46 percent of our respondents highlighted those if i translate that into sort of the large four firms those are about 67 and 41 percent and the difference is also prevailing the attractiveness of the profession by sector so in public sector, it's very much opportunities to acquire qualification as the number one priority. Yet for those in larger accountancy firms, actually that doesn't even factor in the top five. Now that might also be a factor of what we perceive as the big four accountancy firms actually are these days. Long-term career prospects in the public sector was a close second to that. So again, this sense of a career and a benefit and a return to society. So I think those give us some points to mull over, particularly how the public sector is reacting to that, Matt. Yeah, no, certainly. Um, Hanan, can I come across to yourself next as a member of Gen Z, a very young um, councillor in yourself and a very impressive experience already you have. Um, 
do you feel that your career priorities and aspirations sort of line up with or do they differ from your parents, uh, your peers and potentially those in other generations? I agree with what Clive said. Um, as a Gen Z um, student and someone who runs a business myself uh, in a family business, I see my priorities are very different. And in fact, just before this event today, I was speaking to a group of university students as to what their priorities and career aspirations are. And there's a stark difference now. Younger people, Generation Z people want clear clear career pathways and careers that allow them to grow and develop that are more equal but giving them the chance to develop and their skills and their, their aims in life it's very different to the previous generations whereas you work to earn a living whereas here students and generation z people see their careers as something they continue to develop on and grow on throughout their lifetime yeah certainly and john mark obviously part of future proofing our workforce is getting these younger generations in um do you think that the public sector particularly faces some real challenges in future proofing it? I, I do actually, yeah. I, I think there are a, a bunch of big ones, um, <clears throat> sort of general ones, and, and, a, and a couple of um, very specific ones to, to Gen Z, really. The, the big ones are uh, the pretty obvious ones, really. Politics, for example, and I mean with a big P and a small P, where the public sector is sometimes uh, seen to be accountable to, if I can say, the wrong people, as in politicians or, or, or whatever, rather than actually the beneficiaries of public services. Um, there is a there's a challenge, I think, in the public sector in things like budgetary schedules. I know that my own experience of employing Gen Z is that things like let's have an annual budget and let's keep to that annual budget. And if you don't, there's something wrong, particularly, of course, from the point of view of the public sector, where it's public money uh, is a bit of a challenge because to be honest, not just Gen Z, but even millennials and, and even some baby boomers like me are less than entirely happy with things like annual budget schedules because they're fixed and rigid. And then there is the, the issue of timescales. I mean, we've already talked about Gen Z wanting variety in their careers and variability in their careers. Public sector time scales are long ones. The investments that are made on the, on the part of the public sector look forward sometimes decades, certainly years, sometimes decades or even longer. And some of those concepts are a bit of a challenge when it comes to attracting people who want variety on a relatively short term basis every couple of years or whatever it is. So just three, three quite, um, quite big uh, and very often ignored, but nevertheless important concepts there, I think, in terms of challenges for the public sector. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of that very much comes down to sort of, I think, in times, educating and ensuring that people really understand the way the public sector works. And a lot of that has to come from our education and support. Michelle, I know in the Great Alumni Authority, there's been a lot of work done with further education colleges to support young people. Um, I imagine a lot of that support is helping them into careers and to really understand what those are entail. But by all means, rather than me explaining the work you're doing, I'll let yourself. Yes, I think, um, I mean, you know, the mayor's priority is very clear. Uh, we have two key priorities for the rest of this mail term, or I should say three, but two key that ones I'm going to talk about today, which is around young people in particular, um, supporting those people that have been most affected by the pandemic. So young people have been disproportionately affected, whether they were in education or whether they're now struggling to find jobs. Um, and also a secondary focus on sort of good work for all. So those two um, missions combined um, really provide that focus. Uh, we work with London colleges and other training providers as well to really help them support the young people that we want to um, be moving into the careers of the future. Uh, we have a range of support for those um, institutions, um, but by far our biggest investment is the adult education budget, which is for um, people over the age of 19. And we invest £330 million a year into that to help people get the skills they need um, to succeed either in future careers, retrain, um, or to um, build upon skills that perhaps they missed out when they were at school. And a significant proportion of that funding goes to those young people that we're sort of talking about today. Um, the colleges do a range of things with those young people and I think it's fair to say that FE we've heard a lot about it in the last um, few days um, and we are hoping that there'll be even further investment into that sector which is so important for this um, generation who are perhaps looking at more transient careers or moving around uh, within that as well. Yeah and um, Clive obviously education 
and how we support people and young people into work is very important. But the learning doesn't stop when they get into employment, does it? I know reading um, the ACC re a report, which I'm sure we'll be able to share with them, those listening as well, there was a staggering 91% of Gen Z respondents said that learning and continuing to develop their skills was crucial to them. How do workplaces support that continued learning? I think it's reassuring that Gen Z actually understand the, that 91%, the need to keep changing and to continuously learn and evolve because the pace of change that we see in society and in the workplace is going to continue to accelerate. The pandemic has accelerated things, the way we work, but it will accelerate more in the coming years. So I think the sense of continuously learning what that means in terms of picking up skills as you go along um, interventions yes in in structured forms but also in unstructured forms taking opportunities to explore new ideas to apply them is absolutely fundamental yet our results show that about a third of public sector respondents of gen z saw poor learning and development support as one of their three key barriers so I think there is a challenge, particularly in the public sector, for organizations to up their learning and development game and to see learning development teams not as providers, but as curators, because as Michelle sort of hinted and, uh, and others as well, there is a broad opportunity landscape of learning opportunities out there. It's about finding the right ones and using it in the right way that's actually going to help people survive. So L&D teams in organizations need to move away from owning everything to being curators, to being encouragers and supporters and navigators to help people learn. I think for Gen Z, that is particularly important. Yeah, definitely. And staying with yourself, if you don't mind, um, how's sort of the recent shift? Because the last 18 months have been very disruptive for us all. There's been hybrid working, remote working, all of this, particularly for the public sector, which has become quite assured at the let's get everyone in a room and train the traditional way. Mm. How is that impacted sort of the ad hoc learning that you mentioned and how do we manage those challenges? Well, I think first thing we need to talk about is what is hybrid working. Um, hybrid working, I think we confuse two possible concepts. The, the first is about the where, that, that's the location piece. Yes, we've seen a massive disruption in that but we're also seeing a disruption in the what. And we've got to understand what the disruption in the what is to start addressing the, the conundrum that you said about how do we develop skills, because that's the bit that is going to continue to evolve. And that is a much about learning how to cope with support and mentoring in a more remote and distributed environment, but also in a more team environment, because organizations are going to change their structures be less hierarchical be more project centric more collaborative and i think for gen z that's a real opportunity because that's a sort of work life mentality that they want to apply so it's about finding those ways but having the conversation not about the where but about the what and how we deliver the what yeah absolutely and one of the other big aspects of being able to allow these people to be curators and innovators of their own learning and development as well as Gen Z is also getting them into the public sector. It's a very crowded market. It's not the only opportunity in, and there's a lot of very talented Gen Z people. Um, John Mark, yourself first, um, how do we overcome some of those barriers? Yeah, I think uh, the, the, the crowded marketplace analogy is a really, really important one here. Um, there, there's a I suppose it's a sort of an attitude change, I think, really, which could be actually uh, em exemplified by the public sector in the sense that there used to be a phrase, um, we used to talk a lot about the war for talent. And I remember hearing somebody say the war for talent is over, the talent won. Uh, and I think we're sort of in, in, in a position now where that's almost the case. So instead of and not just the public sector, instead of employers saying, OK, this is what we want. We want you all to come here on bended knee and beg us for this opportunity. Actually, we need to start thinking about targeted talent attraction. What's the outcome that we want in the position or the, the team that we're aiming to, uh, to put together? And what, therefore, are the talents and skills that we are looking for? And stepping outside the classic 
um, I'll call it HR or talent attraction process, really, to seek not just those people who already have the, the skills and talents, but those people who possess the potential for those skills and talents. And I think coming back to what something Clive just said about projects, one of the ways to provide a variable career is to base that a person's career on a succession of projects. And uh, projects require uh, skills which are not necessarily function specific, but they are project related. So broader skills, if you like, and promoting the idea that the public sector is an opportunity to engage in projects which are interesting, attractive, will develop new skills and can provide uh, not just the interest and, and, and salaries and stuff like this, but actually fulfillment, which is something that I know that Gen Z is very interested in. Um, these are the sort of things I think the public sector needs to think about in shifting its mindset around how do we attract superb talent rather than how do we just fill this role. Yeah, definitely. And Hanan, if you don't mind, we'll jump to yourself because I saw you were nodding away during that. And I know you're also very passionate about bringing young people into politics and into the public sector and those sort of roles. Um, is that something that you see as well? It's really about showing them the whole picture of it. It's not just the roles themselves, it's what they can get out of the fulfillment of it. No, no, I definitely agree. And I was nodding my head away at that entire answer. I'm someone who was elected into public service at the age of 18 as a politician, one of the youngest councillors in the country. And my biggest issue is in recruiting young people into politics and public sector jobs is they don't feel they get the respect, the opportunity and the chance to fulfil their potential. A lot of political roles and public sector roles are currently just, here's the job, if you can meet our criteria, that is it. We need a whole different change and adapt adaptation to Generation Z. We want, pe people like me want the opportunity to learn and grow, develop our skills, equal opportunities, and our priorities are slightly different. For someone like me, for me, I want to see how we can become more ethical, focus on different 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 objectives. For me, it's the environment, ethics, growing, Whereas my colleagues are like, we need to fill a role. We need to meet a certain budget. This is it. So Generation Z people are, are desperate. We're shouting out for the chance to actually grow, develop, and actually become equals and our, our voice be heard in public sector careers. Yeah, definitely. And I imagine one of the other aspects of that as well is ensuring people are aware of all the varied roles there are in public sector. Michelle, I know that yourselves and the mayor in London has been doing a lot of work with young people to really grow that awareness. Um, how do we, it, it might sound flippant when I say this, how do we stop people assuming the council is only the big men and the clerks behind the desk or is only the, the wise, wizened old politicians? Well, a huge question, I suppose. I, I suppose some of the things we're doing, um, I mean, particularly in relation to careers advice and getting people to go um, from businesses, from the public sector, into schools, into colleges to talk about their experiences of the world of work. Um, we've been doing that um, through something called the London Enterprise Advisor Network for the last few years, and we've just expanded that out um, to introduce five careers hubs across London, uh, where we are um, working with hopefully every school and college in the capital to start to talk about the various different aspects um, of work across a range of different sectors. I think there's also a sort of another role for politicians and, and certainly in London we have a, a young people's um, sort of advisory board who advise on the different policy areas uh, and get them involved in some of the decision making that happens uh, across um, our public services. I mean as somebody that works in the public sector I, I feel that I've worked on a range of different things um, that you don't necessarily hear about uh, when you enter into the profession but um, yeah we're doing a range of things across um, London to help support that. Amazing. It certainly sounds great. And Clive, from your side, um, I think we've, we've covered lots of it already anyway, but is it a case that when recruiting Gen Z, we need to almost take some new approaches, sort of uh, put aside some of the time old traditions and really come at it a different way to make sure that we're fulfilling the requirements those young people have? And I think you're right. And I think Hannan and John Mark summed it up wonderfully. I think we've got to stop trying to produce job specifications and and traditional ways and look at the value a role adds to society. And we've talked about that. And, and as Hannan said, that then becomes a part of the attractiveness piece. 
And I think that is the revolution that we've got to do to actually start attracting people because it's about value. It's about return to society and the motivators that, that Hannan talked about. Yeah, definitely. And Hannan, if we go back to yourself, you raised a really great point in your answer that for you, the sort of expectations and the things that really matter from employment can be different to previous generations. Do you think it's equally important, not only that we identify that Gen Z have these, but we see that the employers also commit to sort of backing those views? Yeah, I'll answer this question based on my family background. So I, during the pandemic, joined my multi-generational family manufacturing business. And I walked into the family business, and this is a, a business that's run for, for, for decades. And the difference was when I walked into the business, all I could see was from my, from my parents' side is we need to balance the books. We have budgets. The business objectives are to make a profit, not make a loss and achieve their targets. And when I walked into the business, I came in with a whole different perspective. I was like, we're in a pandemic. How are we going to adapt now to attract new talent, to attract new employees? And the manufacturing sector is a very low skilled job. Not many university graduates or apprenticeship students want to get involved in the manufacturing industry because they see it as slow daily slogging labor, not as a, a chance to develop. So one thing I did was actually say, look, I, I contacted several universities. I was like, we can offer placements to design students, to fashion students, to students who are doing engineering, and they can learn from the manufacturing sector that it is not just it's not just the, the, the simple day nine to five job. There's so much potential and scope. And I go back to that. We need to show to Generation Z, to students, to people that want to get jobs, that it's not just a nine to five job. This job does not just pay your bills and cover your lifestyle. It's an opportunity to grow, to develop. So when I went into the business, my perspective was, how do we grow? How do we adapt? And for me, is that that is, again, developing. And for me, it was ethics, environments, Generation Z, People are very passionate about their, their working conditions, their working rights, the opportunities to grow, what, what matters to them, the environment's a huge thing, recycling, and that bringing that additional perspective into the business. That was very difficult because the business directors and these employees that have worked for many, many years are like, why is this Generation Z person coming in with all these different alternative proposals? And what we need to be, both public and private sector, is actually give Generation Z people, the, the students and people, the, the chance to actually share their ideas and share their thoughts and allow the both public sector and private sector to develop and grow. Yeah, absolutely. And ultimately, as you say, sharing those ideas is the first step on the journey to learning and improving. One of the other bits you mentioned there, um, there's a lot of sort of consideration around Gen Z as well, around work-life balance. That's a massive consideration for people. And that's actually something that for a lot of organizations probably isn't even necessarily a change that needs to happen. It's something that exists. It's just not very vocalized. Um, Clive, when organizations are putting together recruitment sort of briefs, they're putting together things like health and wellbeing strategies and that, how do they need to be different to what exists already? Or is it just that we don't actually promote them in the way that we should? Um, I think that's a, actually a very interesting question. It may not actually just be a question about Gen Z. I think this is one of the positive things Hannah has been talking about there is how Gen Z can help the broader workforce. Um, and I think we are on the cusp of a revolution about thinking about well-being. Back to my comments also about flexible working and, and what actually the what means. Um, and I think we have got to get smarter about some of the implications of what's happened over the past 18 months in terms of how we support people's development and careers, because mental health and mental well-being issues are going to be significant over the next five years or so. A something like post-pandemic post stress disorder working through and the reality, a Deloitte undertake an annual study on Gen Z, um, and they're reporting that six out of 10 Gen Z people felt that they had a mental health issue, and about 47% of them are actually taking time off work as a result. Now, that's overall, if you actually do a gender split in the female split, that's a far, far larger number, that 47%. I think we do need to be really worried about this, but it's about how Gen Z as well can help us understand the workforce as a whole while supporting their definite mental health needs. Yeah, 
Certainly. And um, Hanan, I realise we're jumping back and forth between yourself and Clive quite a bit, but um, do you think that things like social media and TV have really helped this generation have um, sort of, I, not necessarily a, a broader understanding of it, but maybe normalised a lot more having these expectations of things like mental health, health well-being stuff being considered by their employers? Is it a full advantageous idea, social media and TV? No, but I think it's definitely created awareness. I think through the pandemic, there's been a massive eye-opening revelation that mental health does matter and that working from home is actually a benefit. It could be beneficial, but in some situations, it could be damaging. So I think it's allowed uh, everyone, every generation to realise that they, they can be changes that we never actually considered normal in quotation marks before we never considered maybe working from home as a as a benefit or hybrid working or fluid working hours and i think i think it's helped but i think there's a lot more that needs to be done in the next coming the coming years to make sure we actually future proof for the next generation for me as a student and who works in a business hybrid working is the best thing ever i can choose my working hours i can work around my degree and my business and I'm, I'm, given, I'm given that flexibility to develop and grow and prosper and develop my skills. So I think, and I think that's happened few, uh, through um, TV programs and people actually talking about how the pandemic has affected them and their businesses. I've learned so much through different TV programs where businesses are coming in saying we've revolutionized our businesses because the pandemic has opened our eyes to so many different ways of working and working mechanisms. So it's the start, but a lot more needs to be done. Yeah. Certainly, and I think one of the other areas as well that we have quite a bit still to do, um, John Mark, if we come to you, um, is that there's a lot of routine to the public sector because it's such a broad um, sector, for want of a better word. Um, how important is it for them, especially those that are exploring their options, um, that they see it as a full career? You mentioned earlier the idea of it breaking it down into projects. Is it steps like that that are really going to make the difference? Yeah, it is. And and for more than one reason, really, I think that the variety and variability that's exhibited in an, an organisation or a sector that is perceived to be project driven is the, the sort of attract one of the sort of attractive factors that, that, that Gen Z might might see as useful. I think there's also um, there's something about uh, I had a conversation the other day with somebody who was complaining about young people because he said that they always see work as as a sort of source of fulfillment, whereas it should be a source of responsibility. And, and I thought, oh, OK, workers' fulfillment or workers' responsibility. Actually, that's a sort of false dichotomy because we've already heard today you know, that, that Gen Z has a, a caring and ethical approach, not just to work, but to everything else to do with life. So I think that idea of seeing work and promoting work both as fulfillment and as responsibility is one of the... Um, one of the untrodden roads, I think, that the the public sector could actually could actually tread on, because the public sector occupies a place in society unlike any other form of organisation, because the output that we get from the public sector is a public good. The public sector is not self-interested in any way other than on behalf of society, and I think the promoting that sort of um, sort of social self-interest if you like would be very very valuable for the public sector you know in a way the public sector is a measure of how well uh, a society treats itself and if we are uh, deliberately attracting in a targeted way the optimum talent from our society that's a measure of how well we want to be as a society both in terms of well-being and fulfillment so i think deliberately targeting um, Jen said, with the difference that the public sector represents in terms of its ethical outcomes, its public good results, and its variability and project opportunity, um, would be very valuable for the sector. Yeah, absolutely. And Michelle, I suppose one of the other parts of being able to target and get the best people into the sector is also the routes that we have into it. Um, do you think that we're necessarily doing enough in our colleges to prepare people for this this world of work almost john mark mentioned the idea of responsibility versus fulfillment 
I mean, the role of colleges, I think, is, is hugely focused on this. They focus on a um, significant amount of vocational education. So that is absolutely about uh, not just getting the skills you need for a technical role, um, but also about the wider kind of softer skills about preparing young people um, for the world of work. Um, and we have um, a number of discussions about that all the time, about are people leaving institutions with the right skills, um, albeit um, qualifications versus those softer skills to go into work. So colleges do a huge amount into this. There's also a range of different routes in. Um, apprenticeships um, are absolutely key to that. So um, young people are able to experience the world of work whilst also learning. And I know in my team, I think I currently have about 12 apprentices working across my uh, my team who are um, doing just that, learning whilst experiencing the world of work with us. Um, there's probably always more we can do, um, but I do think the FE is absolutely crucial in that um, learning experience for young people moving into work. And the role of employers is also key um, and their engagement in the system. Yeah, absolutely. You actually stole my next question, which was going to be the apprenticeships, um, but that is great to hear. It really is. Um, and Clive, that is a big part, isn't it? With lots of different routes into the public sector, there's also a responsibility then for those employers to be able to continue this career progression, have a really diverse career progression within it. Mm. I know going back to the report that you had done, we saw the 57% the suggesting that they would move role within two years or they'd have an expectation to. Um, what should public sector employers really be doing to encourage career progression and encourage the understanding of all the different options of career progression? Um, and if they don't do it, is there a risk that they start losing these real talents to other sectors? Um, to answer your, first, your last question first, yes, I think there is a risk if they, they don't appreciate the issue. I think in part the answer we, we've already covered, I think, in the comments we've made about this more project centric, this more value driven uh, approach to work and the more that you are seen to be able to return something back to the stakeholders and go back to John Mark's comments earlier on about what, who the stakeholders are, the public sector, I think that's increasingly important. So it's about giving that sense of return and value is crucial to career progression because it's then through these project activities that you engage people and they learn new skills. And I think that's part of it. If we stick to the judicial structures, then we will see attrition. Yeah, certainly. And Hannah, obviously we've touched on briefly there with Michelle, the idea of apprenticeships and all the different routes in, and there's a huge push at the moment for that, rightly so, so that we get people in. But how important is it that we balance it so that people from Gen Z who are coming in from all manners, including traditional academic routes in, they don't feel that it's somehow a difference to them. Everyone feels that they get an equal opportunity no matter what way in they go. This is a very interesting conversation. Obviously, I'm a counsellor and I'm also a university student. Do I personally feel threatened by students who do apprenticeships? Probably not, no. However, I'm definitely more aware that when I go out looking for a job after I've graduated, there will be people I'm up against who have done apprenticeships, who have got real life experience in their industries. I think there needs to be a very fine balance. We cannot forget the traditional degree routes, people who go through universities, but we also need to ensure that people who do skill-based programs, who do apprenticeships are also given equal opportunities. And I think the real thing is there needs to be empowerment and equality for all Gen Z people. A degree is not better than an apprenticeship. An apprenticeship is not better than a degree. There are different mechanisms to enter the public and private sector and get a career. We need to communicate and be open and actually collaborate with Gen, Gen Z uh, people, students. I don't know what to call them, Gen Z people, um, and allow collaborate with them and give them the different opportunities. For example, if a certain industry, if apprenticeships are better or the better route in, allow that to happen. However, if you're someone who's gone to university and has done a traditional degree route, you are also given the equal opportunity to enter a different industry. We need to be more receptive and more open to trying new things and be very equal and fair in the entire process. Do I think the government is doing the right thing in a, having a big push in apprenticeships and skill-based learning? I think it's definitely what we need. We need to be more vocational and give everyone the opportunity to enter different sectors and we need to we need to let go of the traditional degree route idea you do not have to go to university to be a successful gen z employee yeah 
absolutely that parity across the board is, is key um and John Mark, one of the big things we've seen in the last 18 months is we've seen a huge change in public sector working um but also in our lifestyles as well how important is it to encourage a lot of a push for gen z involvement should i say because suddenly the public sector has a lot of new challenges a lot of new ways it has to innovate and bringing in fresh ideas particularly from gen z but more widely as well is that really going to make the difference yeah the short answer is absolutely yes uh, it takes and, uh, and i hope that my uh, my co-panelists would agree it actually takes quite a long time to change the culture of a single organization let alone the culture of a whole sector uh, and i think therefore we need um, the engagement of a whole generation if i can put it like that in order to change uh, the culture in the in the public sector and I don't say that because the culture in the public sector is wrong I just think it needs to keep up with events which is the way that uh, society's mindset and the way that the world now works has actually become so you know, people have people have changed the way that they view work and what we are seeing now is the shift to the way that people do work and we're talking about a generation Gen Z that uh, is already like millennials, already familiar with variety and variability in all parts of their lives, familiar with all sorts of, of uh, technology and stuff like that. If we want our public services to be 21st century, then actually we need to engage with those people who embody the rest of the 21st century, because they will be bringing with them things that, you know, I as a baby boomer would never dream of and would certainly not be comfortable with in many cases, I'm quite sure of it. So we absolutely need to engage Gen Z in the future of our public services with the knowledge, and this is an important point to make, that at the moment, most of the upper echelon of the public sector are not comprised of Gen Z. And this is what makes things like uh, Michelle's um, uh, shadow board uh, so important, the opportunity to get input directly from that generation right into the top of organizations so that opportunities for future proofing are actually not just talked about, but perhaps implemented too. Yeah, absolutely. And it, like you say, John Mark, it's about bringing especially some of those ideas that wouldn't necessarily be at the forefront of the existing upper echelons. They're certainly going to be there. And I think one of the biggest ones we see at the moment with Gen Z and that is around the environmentally conscious aspects of things. And I mentioned it earlier. Um, quite fittingly, and Clive, I'm going to ask the question to you, where are we going away from COP26, one of the biggest green events we're going to have um, this year? How important, though, is it when organisations do say things and the public sector is great for doing it, of going, we are going to be environmentally conscious, we are going to put in these green steps, that they really do have a genuine desire throughout the industry, throughout the organisation, sorry for that. It's not just a token gesture to get people through the door. I think it's absolutely vital. I mean, whatever bit of media you consume, the message that we're at a crossroads and will continue to be at a crossroads unless we do something about it, it is you know, forefront of our minds. And I think Hannah made the, the point earlier on about how important it is to him personally and also to his generation about addressing this issue because it is about the world that they will inherit longer than dare i say it john mark and i will um dare i say that so i think it is absolutely vital but if we pay lip service to it then we're not going to address the issues and that goes back to what hannon said earlier on about the motivators for gen z we need to be addressing issues and this is the issue of value and the value that we as individuals give to society. And that's the motivator that we talked about earlier on about Gen Z coming into the workplace and changing things, some of the, the stories we've heard as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll stick with yourself for uh, another difficult question. Um, so correct yourself. <laughs> but one of the other aspects is we want to encourage all this talent and we want them to come into the public sector. But the pandemic has also seen, as much as we've become environmentally conscious, we're also now working on quite tight, quite constrained budgets. How do we reassure a lot of these younger, exciting workers coming in that the job security is there, that although it's public sector and it's working on public money and it's tightly funded, there's still a career there, they're still going to continue on? Um, I think we need to link a few of the things that we've talked about through this. Uh, and it's part of reassurance 
Um, we've we've talked a bit about mental health. We've talked a bit about value to society. We've talked a bit about the ESG agenda. It's giving a sense of the projects and the activities that public sector undertaking are vital to the success of society. Yes, we know we are going to be in challenging times. We know that financially there are constraints. Inflation is something we're going to have to deal with and recognize over the next few years. If we betray the generation who have the ideas and can be the catalyst for the future services, then we run the risk of not delivering on ESG and, and other things we've talked about. So it is about reassurance. It's about understanding that that generation doesn't have the paradigm that, that John Mark and I perhaps have through living through inflationary times before, but also they are the generation that saw the turbulence of the financial crash in 2008, 2009 through the early childhood. That is a scar and that requires ex exploration and understanding and sensitivity as well. It's a plea, I think, to understand everything that we've said rather than just to say, here is one solution. It's about this whole conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm very conscious that we're, we're running close on time. So what I'm going to do to sort of close it is go to each of you um, and just very briefly, I want to know if you are genuinely confident that we can bring Gen Z and really get the most out of them in the public sector. And Michelle will go to yourself first, if you don't mind. Absolutely. I mean, I, it's been an absolutely fascinating conversation this morning. I, I have huge hopes for generations. I'm not far away from generations, Ed, although a bit older. And I have huge hopes that, um, you know, we can bring people in and show them what a dynamic and exciting um, environment it is to work in. Certainly. John Mark, do you share similar? Indeed, yeah, we've got no choice. Gen Z are not going to be denied. Yeah, brilliant. And Clive, and then we'll go hand on next. Um, Gen Z not going to be denied. Gen Z have a rightful place in helping us reshape. We need their talent. Definitely. And Hanan, as the representative of Gen Z, but by no means any less experience than the rest of us, how do you feel for it? Um, I fully echo everyone, everyone's answers here. Gen Z are the future. We cannot be denied and we are not going away. And there's great aspirations and potential. And I'm looking forward as someone who is Gen Z myself to see to see where we end up in a few years time. It's very exciting stuff. Absolutely. Um, thank you all so much for taking the time. I know some questions have come in while well, we've simply not got to them. I'm sure we'll be able to potentially share those out with you as well. Um, but it has been an absolute pleasure, it's been a joy, we could talk for this forever, but it very much seems everyone's at with the same approach. Gen Z will be the future, it has to be the future. So thank you so much to Michelle, to Hanan, to John Mark and to Clive for spending the time today. And also to our audience who've been there diligently throughout, I will really hope you have got in some great value from this. Thank you very much. Thank you.